Hello and welcome to Aspire Church Manchester. The message you're about to hear was recorded live at one of our recent services. If you stick around at the end, we'll give you more information about our ministry. But for now, enjoy the preaching. How many came to get here a message that can touch their life? Uh, to the, the words that a man speaks and come from the pages of scripture and commentary on the scripture can be infused with the Holy Spirit to make a difference in our life. And that's what we pray for. We know that without God, we are nothing. I know as a preacher that my words will just fall empty without God and his spirit, praise God. But one thing I do know, and the Bible is filled with this, that God uses men and women to uh, make a difference in people's lives. Today, if you'd like to, uh, actually I'd prefer if you'd open your Bibles up to the book of 2 Samuel. Uh, We're going to start in verse 11, we'll get to chapter 11, we'll get there in just a minute. I heard an audio documentary on crime scene cleanups. Apparently this is a specialized field because these crime scenes can be unbelievably messy as you might imagine. Not just rubbish everywhere like a a robbery of a home, but sometimes there are brutal crimes that have taken place and there's a specialized field uh, uh, we have them here in the UK as well as the United States and uh, they clean up things like blood and brains and bodies I I know it's kind of disgusting uh, to talk about early in the morning but an interesting fact about crime scene cleanups is that if it happens in your own home for many crimes you're not allowed to clean it up yourself You need these specialized help and specialized people who are, let's use a church word, ordained to clean up Christ or crime scenes. I thought it would be good punishment for those who commit horrific crimes to have to clean up their own crime scenes. I thought it would be good for them to go in and see what damage they've done and so that they could feel remorse and regret and eventually maybe repent of what they've done. So today, can we talk about how to clean up your own crime scene? How to clean up your own crime scene? Second Samuel chapter 12, we'll get there in just a minute. Praise God, I apologize that you can't see this that well. When we started in this building, uh, there was no sun for months. And so now that we're in this, so it's a trade-off. You got sun, you can't see the screen as well, but we'll, we'll do our best. Now, I want to tell you that some of the things you think you've done wrong before God, you might not view them as crimes. A lot of people don't view them as crimes committed before God. But the word crime means this, an action or omission, something you left out, which constitutes an offense and is punishable by law. Well, if you think about that in the context of the things of God, every sin fits the the definition of a crime. It's an offense that we commit before God. Whether it's small and everybody does it, it doesn't matter. If everybody stole from the shop, it still would be wrong. So whether everybody does what you do, it doesn't really matter. It's an offense before God. It's a crime. We've all committed Crimes. Raise your hand if you've committed a crime against God. Okay, if you didn't raise your hand, you're either proud or you're not telling the truth. And we'd like you to change both of those conditions here today and open your heart. Because David, King David, everybody say King. King. He's King David of the Bible. And he knows exactly what I'm talking about. Many of you will remember that David was the shepherd boy who grew up to be the giant killer. That's good news for all you young lads in this place. You can grow up from where you're at to being a spiritual giant killer. He uh, became king over Saul. Do you remember Saul was the king, but God had enough of Saul and said, I want David to be king. And David was now ordained as king, but Saul refused to give up his throne And David, with honor and integrity, uh, uh, waited until the time that God had ordained, uh, and uh, he eventually became king. He was the writer of most of the Psalms. You've heard that recently, that that's true about David. He's one of the most important people in all of Scripture. 
what he's most known for, at least in my mind, is that he was a great warrior king. He was a king that wasn't afraid to enter in into battle, and he was very successful at it. But in addition to these truths, David was also flawed, and he made serious errors. That shows us that even good people make mistakes. And he committed what we'll call crimes, crimes. And so here in this text in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and verse 27, it's the last verse of that chapter, we see the origins of his most famous crime. It says in 2 Samuel, uh, actually we're going to get to 27 in a minute. Let's start at the first verse in verse 1. It says, in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle. What time was it? When kings go out to battle. It was a time when kings went out to war. It was not a time for staying home. It was not a time for staying put. It was a time to get on the move. How many know there are times that God has ordained for you not to stay where you're at, but to move forward. Second Samuel chapter 11, verse 1. I know I said 27, but we're on 1. So it says, so David sent Joab and his servants with him and all of Israel, and they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. We don't know why David remained at Jerusalem. Probably he was feeling comfortable and confident. And this is when a lot of crimes occur, our sins occur, is when we're feeling comfortable with the situation. We know how to handle these things. It doesn't mean it's a pleasant situation, but you're used to it. You know what to do, and you don't feel a need to go out and battle these things any longer. But we see that it caused David to have sinful actions, because while he was at home in Jerusalem, he looks on the top of his roof, and he looks down, and he sees a woman. Her name's Bathsheba. Most of you know the story. He begins to look at her as she's bathing naked there, and he looks at her with a lustful eye. He gets turned on. He sleeps with her. She gets pregnant. David's panicked. He doesn't know what to do, so he does what many people try to do, tries to cover up his sin, tries to cover up his sin, only makes it worse, tries to get her husband to come back from battle, sleep with her, so he concocts this whole crazy story of what can happen and uh, this whole uh, kind of thing that he thinks is going to work out. Have you ever read the story about how you got Uriah to come back and try to sleep with her? Did you ever think that that was going to work? Do, do, do you think for a minute that that somehow was going to actually work out? Oh, yeah, so she, Uriah sleeps with her, she has a baby, and comes out and looks just like David. <laughs> you know, I, I mean, the, the, the idea that it would work, but this is what we do when we sin, we cover up. We think we have a plan that no one will know and we're going to make it so we still look good so I can still sit on the throne and I can still be who I'm going to be and I can still have all of the prestige and power that I desire and all of the, 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 the position and the looks and all of that. So many reasons why David's plan was a bad plan. But when you're in the middle of a mess, when you're in the middle of a sinful lifestyle, when you're making the same mistake over and over again, Sometimes coming up with a cover-up plan seems like it's best. Uriah eventually is struck down in battle. This is Bathsheba, the one he had a baby with. Her husband struck down and killed in battle, all because of David's cover-up of the sin. He actually committed not only adultery with Bathsheba, but murder of Uriah. Wow. How many know one sin leads to another? One, one bad decision leads to another bad decision unless we get a hold of it, unless we clean up our own crime scene, which we're going to get to here. So the baby is eventually born, but life seems to carry on. And David carries on as king, and he thinks everything's good. He thinks everything's going to be fine. But the Bible says an interesting thing in the last verse, verse 27. I want to read it with you. Second Samuel eleven twenty-seven, And when the morning was over... David sent and brought her to his house. This is Bathsheba. And she became his wife and bore him a son. Bore him a son. It says, but the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Displeased the Lord. 
This must be one of the most frightening verses in all of Scripture. The fact uh, that David did this thing and David thought he had skated. He thought he got through. He thought he came out clean. He thought everything was going to be okay. But it displeased God. Every one of us as God lovers, as people who have experienced the grace and the favor and the goodness of God over and over in our lives uh, should be very wary of displeasing the Lord. It should be on our minds. And I'm not saying we cower in fear. Oh, I don't want to, don't hit me, please. I'm not talking about that at all. It's because you love him and he's so great and he's so magnificent and you dig, dig him so much that you do not want to displease him. This should be our desire as the people of God. So the time for David to clean up his crime scene is at hand. So in chapter 12, one Verse up from 11.27, we're now at 12.1. God steps in to the cleanup process. David would have to be a willing player, but God was going to inject himself into this crime scene. I want to say to you that you can't fix all of your own crimes before God on your own. You need God to intercede and enter and begin to inject himself into your situation. Look at verse 1. Are you there? Second Second Samuel chapter 12 and verse 1. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Let's just stop right there. Those words are powerful and tell us a lot about how God fixes our lives. The Lord sent a man, his name was Nathan, to David, get this, he so, so often sends someone to us to deal with our crime situation. It might be a preacher, it might be your spouse, it could be a friend, it could be a casual acquaintance. Sometimes it's not even a a person of God that says something that the Lord uses uh, to just come and confront us over our circumstance. David's man was named Nathan. It says, the Lord sent a man to David, and then it goes, he came to him and said to him, then it begins to launch into this big story. I want to tell you today that a confrontation had to take place. For some of you in the house today, you've been coming to church for a long time, and you're just, you know, a religious person. You you enjoy the church service. You like when you're feel good after church, you want to, like, yeah, I went to church, and Pastor Tom made me feel good, and we sang songs, and kids were happy, and all of that, and and, and that's the extent of your Christianity, but in your closet, when no one sees the real you, the real you, come on, that's the, 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 the you that I see, and others see, but there's the real you that you see, and God sees, See, and the real you needs a confrontation, needs a confrontation, the real you. And so he had to confront him. And this wasn't easy for Nathan. I want to tell you that it's never easy to deliver a difficult word to a desensitized heart. It must have been rough on him to come to him and tell him this story. And then David doesn't get it. (laughs) David doesn't even see himself in it. And finally, Nathan has to say, you are the man. So maybe the word that we need to use here is a word called reckoning. Say reckoning. Reckoning means to sort out and settle the accounts. It means to get everything above board and begin to deal with these situations and circumstances that are there. Because David was trying to sweep it under the rug. David was trying to pretend it doesn't exist. Baby, what baby? Murder? Me? No, I don't murder. He was trying to do what many Christians do, just cover it over by going to temple, cover it over by singing songs, cover it over by just uh, having church. I've got to say to you, it's far deeper than that. And we have to learn and deal with these things. And the first thing we see is that there was a reckoning. We must face the facts. Face the facts. To clean up your crime scene, you're going to have to face the facts of what you've done or not done the thing that you've sinned but you committed or not committed. Now, I know that a lot of us here don't want to talk about sin in church. We don't want to talk about the wrong things we've done. We want to uh, get 
help to sort out situations and miracles and all of these things. And there's nothing wrong with that in and of itself, but that's only one piece of God's pie. God has another part that he's dealing with you personally, regardless of your situation, regardless of your problems, regardless of those things. He's looking at the heart. And that's where it was with David. So if you're going to clean up your crime scene, first and foremost, you're going to have to face the facts. Denial is over. No more pretending or playing. No more Christian camouflage. <laughs> you know how Christians, they, they wear camo? You know, not, not just the camo colors, but they camouflage who they really are. But when you face the facts, uh, you're saying it's time to get down to what really matters. Uh, I'm not going to play around. I'm not going to skip class. I'm not going to pretend as if it doesn't exist. Uh, I'm going to get real with God and with my own self. I'm going to face the facts. Five things you need to know about facing the facts. Five things that you need to be able to say and must be able to admit if you're going to face the facts. The first thing that you need to be able to say if you're really facing the facts is that I know that God is trailing me. I know that he's on my trail. He's pursuing me. He's coming after me. See, if you don't think that, then you're never going to get right. If you think God's just standing back as an innocent bystander and just like uh, 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 uninvolved and that he's not concerned whether you sin, get right or not, then you're never going to get right. You're never going to experience this goodness that we're trying to get to here. You've got to know that he's pursuing you. You say, well, he's a big God, man. He cares about the whole planet. He's got people in Africa, the United States, in Mexico, South America, here in Europe. Uh, uh, he, he, he's not concerned with just me. Oh, I beg to differ. I want to tell you, he knows your name. I might forget your name, but he'll remember your name. He knows your name. You have to recognize that the reason that you've been exposed or the reason that all this has come out or the reason God's been dealing with you so heavy-handed is not a coincidence. It's because he's trailing you. Second thing, I know that God is messaging me through a messenger. I know that God is speaking to me through other people. You have to be able to say that. If you don't think that, if you think, Oh, that was just a coincidence or, oh, I don't know. They, they must have saw it. None of those things matter. What matters is that you say, I know that God is speaking to me. If you're facing facts, you have to be able to say that. Number three, I know that I act innocent when I'm really guilty. This is facing the facts. And again, I know, man, some of you are like, hey, I just came to church. I'm going to have a good lunch. I didn't really want to hear all this. But I want to say to you, I want you to have a great lunch. I want you to have a fantastic afternoon. I want the beginning of your week to be top of the list. And that's going to require you to admit some of these things. God wrecked me on all this. He's been wrecking me for a long time on all of these things. I know that I act innocent when I'm really guilty. You can go home and read that whole story, how Nathan confronts David in 2 Samuel 12 there, and you'll see that he lays out this long story and uh, explicit details and gets right to the point, and David still couldn't see himself. I'm not guilty. It couldn't be me. It wasn't until Nathan had to go, thou art the man. That's how deep it had to get. And you have to admit that's how we act. I mean, no, you, 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 you say I'm wrong, but you, you, you don't understand my circumstance. You don't get what I'm going through. Or we play ignorant. Well, I just don't know. I'm not really sure. No, 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 come on. Before God, you know. You know yourself. I know myself. I know when I'm wrong. But... We act innocent. Number four, I know there's no defense for disobeying God. We really have to stop with the excuse making, brothers and sisters. We really do. We really have to get to the place where we say no more excuses. Because, you know, we can always, 
there's a movie that Grace and I have been watching for years. You know, we have like these five movies that we've been watching for the last 20 years, you know. And one of them that says, <laughs> I like that guy. He can talk himself into anything. You know, that's Christians. We can convince ourselves that we're all right. We convince ourselves that all is well in, 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 with us. It's all good in the hood, as we say. It's all good with us. And it's okay. I might be disobeying God, and there's a reason why, though. It's the way I was raised, man. It's all that I've been through. I just need a little relaxation. I just need a little bit of, uh, 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 of getting things right. It's just the way I am. It's my nature. It's where I was born. It's my skin color. It's my attitude. Uh, it's, 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 it's all not a defense for disobeying God. We have to get to that point. Number five, we have to be able to say, admit all these things. I know the consequences of my sin will be painful. We hate all that, don't we? We hate all that. When we get hurt, first thing we want from the doctor to do, anything for the pain? Can you help with the pain? I don't care about how you're going to fix it right now. I just want you to deal with the pain. I don't want to experience pain. I know I need surgery. I know that you're going to have to go in and do this, and I know that this is going to have to take place, but right now I just want the pain taken away, and that's you and I. If we're going to be real and face the facts, we have to recognize that sometimes the consequences of our sin are going to be painful, and I'll even say sometimes drawn out. This is about facing the facts, and get this. Facing the facts is the first checkpoint on this road to an awesome place with God. We want to get to that place where it's awesome with God, don't we? We want to get to that place where we've got the joy of the Lord. I know how you feel. I agree. We want to get to this place where everything's starting to move and, and, and work together and good things are happening. Well, it starts with this, reckoning, facing the facts. The second thing that we're going to have to do is learn repentance. We talked about that last week. We're going to call that fix the fail. Fix the fail. David was referred to as a man after God's own heart. Have you ever heard that before? Yeah. yeah, sure you have. For me, that's hard to digest because as I read the Bible, I see good things that David did. I listed some of the good things this morning at the opening of the sermon, but he's also an adulterer. He's a murderer. He's committed other sins. He numbered the people. He was proud. He can be arrogant at times. He can miss the boat. He can not talk to God. He can do all of his sins that he's committed and sins that he has omitted. And yet he's called a man after God's own heart. His own sins brought judgment on his own house, judgment on the people that he led. I don't see how it could get much worse, but yet he's known as a man after God's own heart. Why was he known for that as that? Well, it's not, as we said, because he's flawless. But I believe it really comes down to one major thing. He took action on his sin. Took action on his sin. When he sinned, small or large, he took action. He made a decision. He just didn't wallow in it. There was a man that I pastored for a long time. He was an opinionated guy. He was in prison for a long time, and he'd read through the Bible several times. He was a prolific reader, so he read a lot of things, and he knew a lot about Scripture and about the things of God. But he was also unwise, and he was also very emotional, and he would say and do things that would get him into trouble and make me angry. He would come up and accuse me of things and correct me and tell me that, you know, you, you don't know how to pastor. You know, uh, I can't believe you preached that sermon. And, and there were times when I would come to church, I'd just be dreading this guy, you know. And I pastored him for a long time. I think God was preparing me for, for Manchester. I, 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 I do. <laughs> but the one thing about him, though, and I always knew this, and I told him that, and I told everybody who would say, why do you put up with this guy? It's because of this. He also knew how to repent. He would come and say, I'm sorry. I let my tongue get ahead of me. He was laced at times with tenderness. He could be so harsh sometimes, but he could also come to uh, uh, help people that were in need. 
he, he had his own business so he could take a lot of money that was for his business and he would give it to someone who had needs in their life. And, and, and I always said, that's why God keeps this man is because he's a horrific sinner. If it was up to me, I'd condemn the guy. But it's not up to me. God says, I see his heart. That's how David was. That's why David is a man after God's own heart. I'm going to just say this. If you don't get anything else out of this point, you know, we need to learn from our sins so we don't keep committing them over and over. But you know what we need to learn most is how to be a repenter, a person who repents. It's amazing to me that when people are in dire situations, they'll cry out to God, oh God, oh God, oh God. But when they sin, they're like, oh Lord. We should learn to cry out before God. Say, God, I sinned. I've done this wrong. I'm I'm, I'm saying harsh things to my spouse, the one who loves me. I'm treating my kids the way that they don't deserve to be treated. Uh, I'm not faithful in these areas. Uh, God, I've omitted uh, giving to you. I keep my money for myself. I don't do the things that your Bible tells me to do. When was the last time you cried out for God for that? A repenter. A repenter. Nathan, as you, we've already said, delivers this word to David. says, you are the man. You're the one. Accuses him, confronts him. But that wasn't enough. Nathan then pauses for David's reaction. God pauses to see how you'll respond to his confrontation. He's not relentless. He's waiting for you to react, to see whether you're going to respond with repentance or with just, as we talked last week, regret. Which one? So David says these words right after he says, Thou art the man. He says, I have sinned. I've sinned. That's his repentance. I've sinned. He admits it. He owns it. In a very short three-word phrase. What Nathan says next is enlightening and shows us about getting right with God. He says, right after I have sinned, David says, Nathan says, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. He doesn't question him. He doesn't evaluate him. He doesn't put him up to the test and see if he's being sincere and legitimate. And the reason I'm bringing this up is because I want us to learn from that. Because sometimes when uh, people, they're, they're just so in love with judging people's repentance. Are they sincere? Do they really mean it? Do they really mean it? I'm going to tell you, at first glance, we take them at face value. Now, of course, there's fruits that has to follow. Of course, there has to be uh, uh, obedience that takes place. Uh, but understand with me, we have to get out of this mode where we're judging people's motives all the time. We have to just take them at face value. It doesn't mean we're, you know, hey, you, you, you burned down my house. That doesn't mean I'm going to let you into my next house right away. But if you say you're sorry, then I take your, your, your apology. Got it? That's important. Because then you see Psalms 51. Psalms 51 is the psalm that David wrote right on the heels of this thing going on. It shows the depth of his repentance. It shows how he's fixing the fail. He's talking about things that are deep and it's intensely intimate with God. I can remember a period in my life uh, where I spent three to four months every day praying that prayer, digging those things out, uh, searching my heart, trying to get things right with God, uh, realizing that what was in my life was not things that I wanted to be there. Attitudes that had been a, a culmination of years of neglect and attitudes of unrighteousness and behavior that I'd learned from other unrighteous people. Uh, it took me a long time. Uh, but you read that, you see that he was sincere. He was repenting. Uh, he was getting things right with God. That needs to be our, our, our instruction manual, Psalms 51. Sometimes what people do instead of repenting is they try to say, well, I'll just give it time and smooth it over. 
it'll get better. I, right now, I've been going through a lot, so that's why I've been blowing up and getting a little hot-headed and all these things. But, you know, a new season will come and everything will be fine. It's never going to be fine. If you've committed a crime, it's not going to be fine by just smoothing it over. If someone hits your car, you're not going to just say, oh, well, hey, you're having a bad day. No problem. It's all good. You're not going to do that. We say, oftentimes, instead of repenting, we smother it with comparison. We say, well, yeah, I did this bad thing, but, man, there's these good things in my life. Well, who, who, who ever said otherwise? Of course there's good things in your life. Of course there's things in your life that are respectable and dignified and are worthy of praise, and, and, and we honor you for all of that. We're, we're, we're not disputing that. But if you've committed a crime in one area... All this good stuff doesn't nullify the bad stuff. Do you get that? That's the difference between Christianity and people who are not even Christians. People in the world think, well, if I do enough good things, that will nullify the bad things. I haven't committed murder, so it's okay that I cheated a little bit and I'm a drunkard. And, and... See, and with God, God says no. So why do we smother in comparison? That's never going to get your sins forgiven. That's never going to get your attitude right. That's never going to get your crime scene cleaned up. You're going to be perpetually in this place where a crime has occurred. Then the last one we all know is denial. We just deny it. We deny that it was even a sin. And we deny that it was even a sin. Someone can point it out to you, quote the scripture, preach it to you, and you'll still say, <laughs> me? Not me. Not me. Denial. And what God is saying is Repent. And what David did in that short three-word phrase encapsulates what we need to do. We have to say, it's me. It's me. I've done wrong. I'm not talking about this self-flagellation where we say, oh, I'm a worm. I'm not worthy. I should just die. God, just kill me now. I'm not saying that. That's not what we're speaking about. That's not godly. As a matter of fact, in one sense, that's his pride. What we're talking about is saying, no, God, I own this. I own this. You're not just saying you're sorry. You're saying I'm sorry because it was me. Got it? It's important. And it's a statement first and foremost. Say this has to be first. Say it again. This has to be first. That you have to say, I've sinned against God. That has to be first in your life. David wrote in Psalm 51 in verse 4, he says, against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. You are right in your verdict and justified when you judge. Do you see how much he's owned that? I can't think of a better words to use. If you get no a fight with your spouse. I mean, I wouldn't quote that if you get in a fight with your spouse. I mean, I don't think that's going to really heal your, your marriage, but that needs to be your attitude. That needs to be your mindset. In Genesis chapter 39, we see Joseph, in verse number 9, he says, No one is greater in this house than I. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then, and this is what he's telling this woman who wants to have sex with him, says, How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? You have to, if you're going to repent, you have to say, first and foremost, I've committed a crime against God. I want to tell you, too many Christians are like the people in jail. I, I, I know about jails. I know a lot about jails. And I preached in a lot of jails. And I got to tell you one thing about jail is no one is guilty. Everyone's in jail because some injustice has been done for them. Or the, your honor, I'm guilty with an explanation. You know, they're, they're, and, and Christians are the same way. Same way. There's a reason why I'm this, and, and there's this, and there's that. And I know I'm carrying on with this a little bit, but I want you to get that because it's a big problem. It's a big problem in us getting right with God. Joseph knew that if he committed that sin with Potiphar's wife, the most significant thing that would he be doing wrong was sinning against God. Do you recognize that every time you fail to do the word of God, you sin against God? <laughs> I'm not saying you're condemned. I'm saying we have to face the facts. It's a reckoning. I'm saying we have to repent. We have to fix the fail. 
And unless we see our action as sin against God, it may be that all we have is regret. And we talked about that last week. It may be. There's one third thing today. We need a reckoning, face the facts. We need a repentance, fix the fail. But we also need restitution. Everybody say restitution. And we're talking now about correcting the consequence of my sin. Repentance is incomplete if I only want to get my heart right with God. If all I want to do is just get right with God, God, I just want to be right with you. I, only, I don't care what happens with my relationships. I don't care about other people. It's just me and you, and I want to get that right. If that's the extent of your thought process when you commit crimes, then I've got to say, your repentance is half finished. You have to recognize, and, and it's one of the reasons why the world doesn't take us serious is because a lot of times when we talk about people getting forgiven, hey, just ask God to forgive you and he'll forgive you. And then, oh, I pray the Lord, Lord, forgive me and all that. And, and we just carry on our merry way. And the world says, well, where's the payment? Where's the restitution? And I've got to tell you, in a, in a, in a way, I agree. Because as Christians, we ought to be willing to not only repent, but also to see some restoration of the wrong that we've done. Every recovery program, Alcoholics Anonymous, Narcotics Anonymous, uh, sexual addiction programs, uh, they all talk about uh, and include a step of making amends. That's part of the healing process. This is part of getting things right. We have to be willing to make restitution and bring restoration. I don't have the answer of all the steps in your particular situation. But I am telling you here today, it's got to start with God, but it's got to finish with restitution. You've got to be willing to do what it takes. (laughs) To me, it's more than a little shocking how Christians leave important things undone. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm just here to kind of enlighten you, hopefully. I mean, you can leave today and do what you like. You know, you are going to do what you like. But give me these moments to tell you what the Bible is talking about here and why David was known as a man after God's own heart after he'd done horrific things, things that most of us would never think of doing. Well, we would think about it. We just might not do it. See, you and I can do nothing to correct the consequences of other people's sin against us. you, You know, if you hate me, spread my name all over the internet as a false preacher and you don't like me and I should, what's bad pastor and all that. It grieves me, made me angry, might upset me, but I can't do anything to correct that. That's on you. What I can do is take what is legit, true things, face my facts, repent of those things that are me and start to fix things with people who have legitimate Complaints against my behavior. Does that make sense? I want you to look with me at 2 Samuel chapter 12. We're just about done. Hang in there. Chapter 12, verse 24. 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 24. Then David David comforted his wife Bathsheba and went into her and lay with her and bore a son and he called his name Solomon. Just a side note, uh, notice that their, their sexual intimacy uh, was called comforting his wife. I want to tell you that you can, t- I can tell you that that just wasn't some like, hey, let's have a quickie on the uh, afternoon, you know. This was something where I'm tender towards you. I understand you're going through some things. Uh, I want uh, to take care of your needs more than I want to take care of my needs. I know you weren't coming to church asking for that, but... Sometimes some of you need to hear that, right? Can some of you ladies say amen? (laughs) Lay with her. She bore a son, called his name Solomon. Look what the next phrase, and the Lord loved him. The Lord loved him. Send a message by Nathan 
the prophet. That's significant. So he called his name Jedidiah because of the Lord. A result of David's repentance was God restored his relationship with him. God said, me and you are good now. I'm, you're, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. There were other ramifications that, needed to take, that David needed to understand and needed to be dealt with. And that could only be dealt with through restoration or restitution being paid. Uh, and so uh, he did that with Nathan. I mean, no, he lied to Nathan. He didn't like what Nathan said. He was kind of putting Nathan, the prophet, the one he knew, at arm's distance, sometimes don't like the messenger. Don't like when the pastor tells me, hey, keep my kids in, in order. Hey, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Hey, it's not, well, I don't like when wife tells me, hey, you were wrong. Don't like that. But if you're going to really be repentant, you're going to fix that rest, re- relationship with restoration. Did it with Bathsheba to the point where she is because she could have very easily claimed abuse. You have power over me. You made me. You brought your men to bring them up to me. The reason I lay with you is because I didn't know what else to do. You were the king. I didn't really want to, but I had to. You made me your wife because that's the way the rules were in that culture. And what choice did I have? Could have could have said all that, but instead. She is comforted by the fact that now she has a son and things are getting better because David wasn't just a blundering, blathering fool. He was making restitution with her. And then we see the mercy of God. The Lord loved him. The Lord loved him. God, brothers and sisters, face the facts. It's painful. Those five things I gave you, difficult, not easy repentance, uh, none of us would say, I love repenting. We love the outcome of repenting, but we don't love repenting. Restitution costs us something. Restoration, there's a payment for that. But the Lord loved him. Grace is such a powerful thing. It's almost hard to get your head around the fact that the Lord could love us after the way that we behave out of the way we misbehave, but yet that's a biblical truth, wonderful biblical truth, and not one that should be just taken lightly or flippantly or one that should just be, yeah, he'll forgive me. Oh, word, you, you, you don't get grace. You don't get, you were on the hook for the crime. A crime scene had occurred, and God came in and said, look it, let's clean this mess up. Solomon was David and Bathsheba's son, What was he known as? The wisest man, right? The wisest man came out of that. That's only grace. Can God, you know, some people have said uh, to to Christians when they've been devastated by sin or by actions or by things aren't going their way, they say, well, that's it for that church. Well, that's it for that couple. There's nothing more for that group. I want to tell you, man, God is famous for rising people up out of the ashes. God is famous for restoring marriages. God is is well known for putting mothers and sons and daughters back together again. It's the grace and the power of God. Out of David and Bathsheba came Solomon. Think about that as you're chewing on your lunch this afternoon. These past two Sundays, we've been serving up some strong meat. And to some, I think it's been hard to swallow, been a little bit difficult for some. But I want to tell you that even though it might be difficult to digest, you should never feel like you have a hopeless future. That's not the purpose of these messages. That's not why God sent Nathan. That's not why God confronts us with these things. The conclusion that the Bible wants you to draw is what we've laid out for you today. It's a reckoning. It's a facing of the facts. There's repentance involved and restitution, but the grace of God uh, is coming quickly after that. All so we can experience the wonderful favor from God. How many want to have a blessed week? We pray every week. Have a blessed week. Are you willing to repent of your sins? 
Are you willing to come before the Lord and say, Lord, I've experienced the grace, the forgiveness, the power. I've had miraculous things take place in my life. The goodness of God has been part of my daily walk, and yet here I am uh, still acting like a sinner, still acting like an unbeliever, still not carrying out the scriptures. Is that you? Good news is we can face the facts today. We can get it right and see God do some wonderful thing. If you're on the floor you're about ready to get up. Today you say, I'm going to get up. He's rooting for you. Come on, you can do it. Come on. How many, some of you men, you love boxing, and you know when your boxer hits the canvas, you're like, ah. But then they're giving him the count, and you see him start to move. You're like, come on, come on, one more time. You can do it. That's what God is doing for us. You can do it. Come on. You hit the canvas, come on. Wonderful truths about God today. Can you say amen? Amen. How to clean clean up your own crime scene. Give Jesus a big hand clap of praise. (laughs) Hallelujah. (laughs) Lord God, we thank you for the grace that we see in the story of King David. We thank you, Lord, that even though he did horrific things. We know we've done those things. We know that we've made huge blunders. Lord, when we should have been faithful, we were faithless. When we should have been committed, we were floundering and wandering. When we should have been walking that pathway of truth and righteousness, we were walking our own road. We admit it today. Lord, help us to face the facts. Help us to fix the fail correct the consequence. Lord, we pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen. So our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed. Is there anybody here in this church house today you'd say, I don't know if I'm a Christian. I mean, I've been coming to church for a while, but I don't know where I stand before God. See, Christians know this, that if they die, they go to be with the Lord. They know that. that that's not just something they hope or wish or kind of putting a little bit of stock in. It, it, it's a confirmation. And if you want that confirmation, we can pray with you and lead you to Jesus today. It's that simple. We're only one church in a church of millions on the planet. Many, many Christians preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. We don't have the power to, uh, on our own. We're just going to share with you the good news of Jesus and how he can forgive you of your sins. And that prayer that we'd like to pray with you is a special in the sense that the Lord will do great things. It's not special and unique to Aspire Church. It's one that the Lord offers up for us to pray. If you need him as Lord and Savior, why don't you lift your hand all across this place today? We'll pray with you. We'll lead you to Jesus with a simple prayer. Praise God. Praise God. Today then, brothers and sisters, I'd like us all to stand to our feet. Could you do that with me today? As we stand to our feet, we want to close out today's service with an admission that We've committed crimes to God. I know we don't like to use, it sounds like such a strong word. I know, I get it. But that's a part of the problem, is that we want to always weaken, and we want to lessen and diminish, dull, and not make it so bad. But it is what it is. Ones that want to get right with God say, it's me. We don't need someone to say, thou art the man. We just raise our hands and say, I am that man. If that's you and you say there's some things, they may be very small in the, eye, in, in, in the, the context of all of what we've talked about today. But nevertheless, crimes are crimes. You want to get those right. You want to start being honest, stop being so proud, and start being more real, more honest before God. Is he speaking to you about that? Come on up to the front. Just make your way out. Come on up to the front. I know he's speaking to some lives here today. Let him touch you. Let him touch you today. You can kneel down if you want. There's a place to kneel. You could stand if you want. You could sit. There's no real protocol for coming before the Lord. It's up to you, whatever's comfortable for you. But brothers and sisters, I just want to say that it's a wonderful thing when people are getting their hearts right with God. When I became a Christian, I didn't know anything about the Bible. I went to a church, our church, (laughs) 
there in, in, in L.A. And there was about 150 people attending church at that time. And I, 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 I didn't know a lot. But one thing I did know is that all the people that I talked to have talked about, they wanted to get their hearts right with God. And they were so thankful that Jesus saved them from their sins. And some of them that had been raised in church were so guilty that they had been religious for so long, but not really in relationship with the Lord because they hadn't really repented. And now they had learned about repentance and restoration, restitution, these concepts that we're talking about today, to where it, it was more than a sermon, it was a lifestyle for them. And I've tried to carry that on throughout my life because it's been real to me. You know, I already shared in this message that there's been seasons where that has not been the case, seasons where it was difficult for me to, be, to claim that I was that man, as a matter of fact, I was more aligning myself with those who were unbelievers than I was with believers in, in certain aspects of my life. And I think if we're honest, we can all identify with that. But the good news is, is that this message, this truth is there for us today. You can do great and awesome things. God has great things for you today. Awesome things. Father, we just come before you in the name of Jesus we pray over these who are at the altar, Lord God, as they're setting their hearts on fire, as they're bringing their hearts before you for a cleansing, as they're bringing honest truths about their life to you. Lord, that are bringing brokenness in certain areas, uh, dysfunction in other areas, uh, things that have to be turned around. They're being honest. They're being honest. And Lord, I thank you for your goodness today. I thank you that you forgive us of even horrific sins, that you're able to restore us, help us to pass that along to the relationships uh, that we have. Lord God, let that be our life, Lord God. Thank you for the scripture that says you love David. You love David. You love David. Because if you love David, then you can love us. We receive that today, Lord receive that today in jesus name amen and amen thank you for joining us today at aspire church if the message today has blessed you or there's something we can help you with we'd love to hear from you send us an email to info at aspirechurch.co.uk we meet in different locations throughout the week and if you'd like to join us in person we'd love to have you visit us you can find all the details on our website at www.aspirechurch.co.uk or if you'd like further information find us on Facebook look us up on Twitter we also live stream all of our services and once again if you'd like to view online you can find all the details on our website thank you for joining us today being part of our ministry we'd love to help you in any way that we can God bless you